Today's video is going to be a deep dive on one of my favorite topics, the mitochondria. So I have a lot of different videos that do discuss the mitochondria, but today is going to go more in depth and you're going to want to stick around till the end because I'm going to share a couple combinations of different biohacks that I use and I've shared before. And if you just want to skip this and jump straight to the biohacks, there's a link below for my biohacking guide. But I'm going to share some combinations of some of these biohacks that you can do to not only improve your mitochondrial health, but to improve your cellular health, to further decrease inflammation, and to enhance your immunity. So if you're new to my channel, thanks for checking it out. My name is Nathan Walls, and I help people that struggle with energy, brain fog, low motivation, and I help them have vibrant energy, really good focus and get their mojo back so they can do the important things that they want to do in their life. And I do that using the science of energy optimization, which is really all, which really all comes down to mitochondrial health. So every chronic disease today is driven by poor mitochondrial health. And we're going to jump into that. So I do have some slides because the content is a little bit technical. So if you're a little bit geeky like me, if you like science, you're really going to dig this talk because I'm going to get into a lot of the science of what drives disease and what we need to do to reverse disease and increase longevity and increase health span. So the goal in your life shouldn't be lifespan. I mean, you should want to live a long life, but before that, you want to, you want to increase health span, which is aging and maintaining your health while you age. Because what good is saving up a lot of money, working really hard, having a lot of money, if you feel like crap and you can't do the things you want to do. You can't be fully present with your children, with your family. And you can't do all the stuff that you love doing. So let's jump into it. Let me just kind of switch it here. Hey, I'm back. So anyway, uh, today's talk, Mitochondria 101, how to stay young. So let's jump right into it. So one of the first things I really want to bring to your attention is the three different genomes in our human body and the fact that these three genomes work together. And for you to have optimal health, for you to have vibrant energy, to think really well, to perform well, and ideally to be an optimal human. That's my goal for my clients. That's, goal, that's my goal for me. But to become an optimal human and perform at your very best, you need all three of these genomes working together. So all three of these genomes, they do work together, they do communicate. And let me just dig into these a little bit. So number one, we've got the human genome. So most people are familiar with the human genome. And it was about 15 or so years ago, maybe a little more at this point, I think it was about 15 years ago, where they mapped out the human genome. And prior to that, they were thinking that humans were going to have hundreds of thousands, millions of genes because we are the most complex animal. And for example, an earthworm has more genes than humans. So there's some kind of anomalies there, but they did map out the genome. There are 20, a little over 25,000 genes in the human genome, which is also called the nuclear genome. And this genome you get from mom and dad. And this makes up a lot of your characteristics. So if you have blue eyes, if you have brown hair like me, um, that came from my parents. My body type came from my parents and their parents. Some, some of these genes skip generations. But the interesting thing is 98% of research at the NIH is on the human genome or on the nuclear genome. And you've got these two other genomes that all interact with it but we don't really know a whole lot about them. So the focus of this talk is going to be on this genome right here, which is the mitochondrial genome. So the human genome has got 25,000 genes. The mitochondrial genome has 37 genes. And those genes are to, to code specific proteins to make new mitochondria. And the mitochondria's sole function, it has a couple of different functions, but one of its main functions is most people remember from going to, to grade school, uh, your science class, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And that's really the key to you living a long, healthy life because the mitochondria 
it makes the energy for your body to do all the different things that you do, for you to speak, for you be, to be able to move, for you to be able to run. When you get an injury, for your body to be able to repair itself. My son, he's four, he's going through a huge growth phase right now. And that growth, that's driven by his mitochondria. So with your mitochondria, you get all of your mitochondrial genome from your mother. So to get a good idea of your starting point for your health, you can look at the health of your mother and your mother's mother. So if the health of your mother and your mother's mother is not great, that's not, it's not the end of the world, but that means you're going to have to work a little bit harder and you're going to have to do some more things to maintain the health of your mitochondria. And there are different biohacks, which you can find on my biohacking guide, that are going to help you do something called mitochondrial biogenesis, which means grow new mitochondria. So it is possible to grow new, new mitochondria. It's possible to repair the mitochondria that you have that have become damaged just from toxic, toxic exposure or different sources of inflammation. And as you repair your mitochondria, as you create new mitochondria, your body makes more energy. With more energy, not only do you feel more energetic, but your body, you can think better because your brain is a, a, is a, it's an energy hog. It makes up 2% of you, but it uses up 20% of your body's energy production. So when your body's not making a whole lot of energy, it shows up in your brain pretty quick. And for some people, that can be brain fog. For other people, that can be depression, anxiety. A lot of the, the mental um, illnesses we're seeing today are just different mental challenges that people have, like having occasional anxiety or depression, or at all the time, is really brain-based. And at the heart of it, it's due to the brain not making enough energy. There's more to it than that. But when you have an energy deficit, your body can't do everything that it wants to do. Kind of like in California, they have rolling brownouts where when it's really hot out, not everyone can use their air conditioner. And that results in some people being uncomfortable. When your body has rolling brownouts, that's symptoms that result in you being uncomfortable. Now, the next genome over here, this is the microbiome genome. So you're in your gut, you have trillions and trillions of bacteria. You have more bacteria in your gut than cells in your body. And you have trillions of cells in your body. So it's, it's pretty crazy when you think about it. But these bacteria, they're, they're very, um, they're very small. They're much smaller than our cells. And that's why we can have more of them than cells. But it turns out that in our microbiome genome, there's something like 22 million to 232 million genes. So different scientists believe different things. In the grand scheme of things, this is still a relatively new area of study. But the key is that these all work together. And if you want to maintain health and longevity, you want these to, to have good communication. And the other thing is you have the most control over this genome over here, your microbiome genome. So that is constantly changing throughout your life. When you're, when you're born, especially if you have a vaginal birth, you get inoculated with bacteria from mom. And you can be chugging along, going through life. You have a very good immune system. But then you get sick from being in contact with another kid or something. And the doctor puts you on antibiotics. That completely alters your, your uh, microbiome genome or your, your gut genome. And that then has an influence on your mitochondrial health and your mitochondria actually turn on and off genes in the nuclear genome. So just a couple examples you have so far that we've identified. It's probably more than that at this point, because this is constantly evolving. There are, there are thousands of scientists, maybe hundreds of thousands of scientists around the world that are researching the gut genome, but at this point we know of 116 microbial genes that influence aging and lifespan. So we can do things that activate these genes in the gut genome that can increase, that have anti-aging benefits, that increase longevity. And that's really the key. Now, unfortunately, most people today and due to like the, the standard American diet, due to exposure from having like your phone or your laptop by your gut, 
that creates a leaky gut. That alters, bacteria are very sensitive to electromagnetic radiation. So that can alter the flora in your gut. But you also, in your gut, if you do the wrong things, you can activate genes that can set you up for neurodegeneration or that can even um, cause autism in kids. So it goes both ways. There, there are switches for our genes. The, the gut genome at, works with the mitochondrial genome, and then the mitochondrial genome activates the human genome. It turns genes on and it turns off depending on what it's exposed to in the environment. The environment can be food, it can be electromagnetic radiation, it can be a chemical exposure, it can be fresh air. So good, good environmental exposures can, it can also be stress, which is a huge one today. So the, the bottom line is good environmental exposures and doing the right things activate genes that help us. Poor environmental exposures and doing the wrong things activate genes that cause symptoms, disease, and shorten our lifespan. So I kind of, I already hit on this. So the, um, the gut genome talks to the micro, the, uh, the uh, mitochondrial genome, which turns on and off genes in the human genome. Now, one key, one of the things that we know backed up by a lot of research is by increasing bifidobacteria, you can directly promote human genes that increase longevity. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky. You can't just take a probiotic that has bifidobacteria because the key for this is you need the right bacteria in the right place. You need to do that by eating the right foods. And there are some hacks that you can do using the right combination of foods to substantially increase your bifidobacteria populations. And what that does is when bifidobacteria breaks down the food that you eat, that creates metabolites. Some of those metabolites actually break down to butyrate, which keeps your gut lining protected, keeps it healthy. It also regulates metabolism. It increases fat burning. It improves immunity. But the other things, the other thing it does is it cross feeds other bacterial populations in your gut. And that's really the key to having that good microbial diversity in your gut by eating the right foods. Uh, a lot of people today have been spending a lot of money on probiotics and not getting very good results. And some people, after being on probiotics for many years, they're getting SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, getting the wrong bacteria in the wrong place. Because when you take, take a capsule, you don't know when it's going to release. So there are some that are better than others, but for the most part, unless you're working with a very experienced practitioner that, that really understands how the gut works, some people can end up doing a whole lot more harm than good. So pay attention to that. So other gut bacteria activate human genes involved with inflammation. So again, when you do the wrong things, when you when you eat the wrong foods, when you have the wrong exposures, you can alter your, your gut genome, which has a negative influence on your mitochondrial health, meaning less energy output, which means they activate different genes that can increase your risk for cancer, that can uh, slow down your metabolism so you accumulate more stored energy, which is fat. So this uh, mitochondrial health, actually, uh, it really kind of starts in the gut. And it, st it starts with your environment and creating that, that healthy environment that is going to activate the right genes over here so you live a long time and you avoid disease. So let's talk about ATP. So ATP is the energy of life. So your mitochondria make three things, but one of the main things they make is ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. So the T is for tri three, three phosphates, but it's the biological currency of energy. Not only that, but it maintains your body temperature. So regarding mitochondria, mitochondria, there's two main haplotypes. There's a whole bunch of haplotypes but we can break those into two general areas. So one is tightly coupled, meaning your mitochondria make more ATP and less heat production. And people that evolved by the equator, so people from Africa, they're tightly coupled because it's very hot by the equator. They don't have to worry about cold, but there are a lot more threats to your life, especially going back hundreds of years. 
Um, and, and even modern day now, now in Africa, because they still have lions and hippos and rhinoceros and tigers and things that can run you down and just eat you. So you need the ability to, to run your ass off to evade these different threats of danger. Whereas people that evolved in more northern places where it's a lot of cold, their mitochondria will make more heat. It'll be a more even mix of, of energy to keep the body going and heat to maintain body temperature. So this, this is, uh, it's important to know because people that are loosely coupled respond better to cold. People that are tightly coupled respond better to strong sun. So I'm not saying you can't, you can't do the other. It's just that's the preference of your mitochondria to what they respond best to. So if you have a lot of melanin in your skin, aka you're black or, or very, very brown, you need more sun to, to make enough energy for your body. You need more sun to have healthy vitamin D levels. Whereas if you're very light skinned, you absorb more sun, you need less sun. So your mitochondria, in addition to making ATP, they also make carbon dioxide. So you breathe in oxygen, you exhale carbon dioxide, and that's from the process of respiration. And you can't see it, I've got a plant right here, but I'm, ex I'm constantly exchanging carbon dioxide for oxygen from this plant. And the other thing that your mitochondria make is water. So the water that your mitochondria make is different than the water that you drink. And that's really how your cells become hydrated. It's from your cells become hydrated from your mitochondria making water. And it's actually, it's a different kind of water. It's instead of H2O, it's H3O2, and it's more, more gel-like. And so, for example, I have an aloe plant, and, you know, if you cut off the leaf, you can see that it's, it's kind of clear looking, but it's, it's very gel-like. And you can squeeze it. And if you squeeze it, you might get a few drops of water out. But if I were to put that aloe in a juicer, I would get a whole lot of water out. And the reason that the water doesn't, when I cut the leaf, it doesn't all just come squirting out is because it's structured water. It's at H3O2, which is more gel-like. It's actually the fourth phase of water. So for, for water, you've got liquid, you, you have solid, which is ice, you have gas, which is when you boil water, forms a vapor. But the fourth structure is, is gel-like, and it's structured in, in H3O2. So that's important because if your mitochondria aren't working well, your cells are going to be dehydrated. Your, your cells need to be adequately hydrated to work well. Your proteins need to be in water to work. The proteins inside of your cells that make all these different things. Not only that, but um, your when your your cells make water, they charge separate it. That actually helps your body detoxify. It also forms a battery. So if you're healthy, if your mitochondria are working well, you actually make more than your own body weight in ATP every single day, which is crazy because these are these little mitochondria, they're so small you can't even see them. They're 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 minuscule. And they're making these little molecules that you can't even see, but they make so many of them that it exceeds your body weight every single day because you're constantly burning through ATP. You constantly need energy, especially during the day. So key point, a lack of energy production is the single cause behind all chronic disease that we're seeing today. That's cancer, diabetes, obesity, um, autoimmune diseases, uh, neurodegeneration, heart disease. All of these are driven by poor mitochondrial function. So how do you reverse the disease? You fix the mitochondria. And a lot of what I'm sharing today, if you want to go deeper and, and really kind of geek out, is stuff I learned from Dr. Doug Wallace. So um, let's dig into ATP a little bit more. But NAD positive oxidizes glucose to form carbon dioxide and water. And a hot supplement today is NAD positive. And a lot of people, they know this link that you need NAD positive. And NAD positive drops as you age. But a lot of people know that there's a correlation between your NAD positive levels and your mitochondrial output. So they're like, oh, I'll just take this supplement. 
And it doesn't quite work like that. And some people take it and they have good results. Other people take it. They don't notice anything. But we have some research now showing that if, if you take, if you supplement NAD positive and you're older, that can actually increase your risk for cancer. So there are natural ways you can do it without taking a supplement. And those are the things you want to be doing. One of the keys to maintain your NAD positive levels is your circadian rhythm. Because your circadian rhythm, when it's working properly, it makes something called nocturnum. Nocturnum, that makes NAD positive. So when you're staying up late watching TV, when you're on your phone all the time, that destroys your circadian rhythm. Then your body makes less NAD positive and your mitochondria make less energy. They make less AD less ATP. So energy is obtained from the oxidation and is stored as ATP. So water hydrolyzes ATP, releases energy forming ADP. So remember, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Uh, it breaks that phosphate bond. Now you have adenosine diphosphate. You go from three phosphates to two. So the energy from ATP is used by the cells to drive reactions and perform work in the cell. We need ATP for our body to do all the stuff that it has to do. So each of your cells, you have mitochondria in all of your cells except for your red blood cells, but each of your cells has anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 mitochondria. Each of these mitochondria make 150 millivolts, which isn't a whole lot, but here's the deal. You have 10 to the 17 mitochondria. That's 100,000 trillion mitochondria. And when you add it all up, that's equivalent to a bolt of lightning. That, that's, that's the kind of energy your body's making every single day. It's pretty crazy, right? So this, this is also very uh, important that I want to point out. But one mole of glucose, meaning one molecular, molecular unit of glucose, makes 36 ATP. One mole or one molecular unit of fat makes... Anywhere from 129 ATP to 146, depending on the kind of fat. I, I believe it's palmitic acid that uh, makes like 146, which is from coconut oil. So fat is a much uh, denser source of energy than carbs. So fat is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You just want to be eating the right fats. Fake fats or... Uh, you know, factory-made fats, things like canola oil, soy oil, veg different vegetable oils, those are not healthy forms of fat. But fats like olive oil, coconut oil, fats from a animal that's raised the right way, so like a grass-fed cow or a pastured pig, those, those, those are healthy fats. And your body breaks down the energies, the uh, electrons from those fat to make ATP. So energy is also made from the formation of water. So your mitochondria make ATP when they break that bond. That makes energy, but your mitochondria also make water. That's a chemical reaction. And when, when your mitochondria make water, that reaction releases 286 kilojoules of power. So the way your, your mitochondria make energy is called electron transport chain. So before I was talking about the 37 genes in mitochondria that code for proteins, you've got five proteins in your mitochondria. So you've got cytochrome one through five, and electrons enter, enter in here. Electrons and protons, and those protons are hydrogen protons. So kind of visualize, if you can visualize a straw, and you fill that straw with BBs, if you put one BB in the other end, a BB pops out the other end. And that's how it is with these electrons and protons. You need a constant supply of them running through. And out the other end pops ATP. So cytochrome 5, it's called an ATPase. It spins. And when it's working well, it spins at 9,000 revolutions per minute. And as it's spinning, it's kicking out ATP, which your body uses for energy. Now, the other thing I want to point out is there are two different isotopes of hydrogen. So you've got protium, which is an electron and a proton, and you have deuterium, de deuterium, which is an electron, a proton, and a neutron. Now deuterium, it does have its role in the body. When you accumulate too much deuterium, when you do things like shift work or just stay up late at night exposed to blue light that creates inflammation, your body accumulates these, these deuterium um, 
hydrogens and they have an impact on your mitochondrial energy output. So as you accumulate deuterium from living an unhealthy lifestyle, your mitochondria make less and less energy, then you get symptoms, get chronic disease, and you die much sooner. So your mitochondria, they're using electrons, and then the oxygen, that's an electron acceptor. Um, and then that oxygen, it accepts the, uh, the electron, and then it turns into carbon dioxide and ATP. And the carbon dioxide, you, you breathe out and you exchange with plants. So all food, at the end of the day, all food is broken down into electrons. Some food has more electrons than others. So fat has a whole lot more electrons than carbohydrates do. Protein is, is somewhere in the middle. But all the food you eat, it's all broken down to electrons which go through this electron transport change chain. Now the key, the, a really key fat to increase your body's energy production is DHA. And you want that DHA to come from seafood because there's different kinds, there's different molecular forms of DHA. So there's SN1, SN2, and SN3. In order to get DHA into the cell, it needs to be in the SN2 position. And the reason is, is because SN2 is paramagnetic meaning it's drawn to magnetic fields. And there's a gas that your body uses that's also paramagnetic, and that gas is oxygen. So remember, this is an ATP as it spins around. What do motors create? Magnetic fields. So that magnetic field, that draws DHA into the cell. That gets oxygen into the cell. And when you accumulate DHA, not only is that a part of your cell membranes, it's a part of the outer mitochondrial membrane. It's a big chunk of your brain. And it's, it's very, very important for your, your neurological health, but it's also very important for your body's energy production. And what that does is that helps you collect more electrons. Because remember, you need this constant flow of electrons going through your mitochondria in order for you to make more energy. So with DHA, you can collect more energies, more electrons to make energy, especially when you get sun exposure. Now, blue light and non-native EMF. Non-native EMF is any man-made EMF. So EMF from wireless radiation from your sun phone, your sun phone, your cell phone, or from Wi-Fi, or a magnetic field from a motor from some appliance in your kitchen. Anything you plug in or has batteries creates some kind of electric pollution that creates inflammation. This inflammation stretches out these respiratory proteins. Now, it turns out that every one angstrom increase in the distance of these proteins from each other, that, de that decreases energy production by a factor of 10. So that's a huge decrease. So to give you an idea of just how small an angstrom is, you've got a, milli a millimeter is about this, this tiny. And in a millimeter, you've got a million nanometers. So imagine a millimeter broken up into a million, or uh, yeah, a million equal, equally sized pieces. That's a nanometer. Take a nanometer, which is super tiny, break that into 10 pieces. That is an angstrom. So this, these things are operating on subatomic levels. So the key takeaway here is inflammation destroys mitochondrial function. So whether that inflammation comes from blue light, from EMFs, from eating a Big Mac, from being stressed out, all these different things have an impact on your body's energy production. So heteroplasmy. Heteroplasmy is a fancy word for aging. So I mentioned Doug Wallace before. I do want to give him credit. This image is from one of his slides. But it turns out that heteroplasmy drives disease. So heteroplasmy can happen in different parts of your body. But when you have high heteroplasmy in your heart, that's heart disease. When you have high heteroplasmy in your brain, that's neurodegeneration. And on the way there, you get different symptoms. You get symptoms if it's in your heart, like high blood pressure. Like you get winded easy, easily. Um, your heartbeat gets erratic. For your brain, you get symptoms like brain fog, like having a hard time focusing on what you're doing. Anxiety, depression, migraine headaches. These are all signs that you have higher heteroplasmy and you want to do something to correct it before things get much worse. 
Now here's the, the really cool thing is you have a very high threshold for disease. So a healthy cell, op, under an, an optimally healthy cell has 100% function of mitochondria. But guess what? You can get away with doing a whole lot of stuff. So let's say you just, you haven't lived a great lifestyle like I didn't for more than 20 years of my life, really abused my body. I, I drank a lot. I did, did some drugs. I wasn't sleeping well. I ate healthy food. I worked out. I looked good on the outside, but I was doing a lot of things that were harming my mitochondria. And you can actually do a whole lot of damage and have 30% of your mitochondria in a cell not working well, and you still have healthy cell function. You can actually have 60% of your mitochondria not, not working. And what I mean by not working is they're not making energy. They're mutated. And this, the cell still means healthy function. But once, as you approach 70%, that's the threshold. So when you have about 70% of your mitochondria not making energy, that's when the cell has to make a choice. It either does something called apoptosis, which means programmed cell death. So you can make a new cell that have a higher level of function of mitochondria. But if, if your cells aren't working well, if your body, if your, especially if your circadian rhythm isn't working, if your body has low levels of melatonin, then apoptosis isn't working. When a cell chooses not to die and chooses to keep on living, that's cancer. So this is, this is a really big deal if you want to maintain your health for the long term. So I mentioned before, inflammation, it's behind all chronic disease. There's three main, there's three main external sources. There's diet. So most people know that no inflammatory foods, sugar, uh, processed foods, gluten, all these things cause inflammation. Stress. Dealing with the stress of, at the time of this recording, we're seven months or so into this whole coronavirus BS. It's, it's stressful for a lot of people. A lot of people can't, can't work their jobs. That's a stressor. Stress can be internal. You beating up on yourself. You look in the mirror and, and you're fat and you call yourself, oh, I'm, I'm such a, such a loser or something. That's an internal stressor that causes inflammation. Then there's environmental. Breathing in chemicals that you're exposed to. And environmental is tricky because lots of times you can't see, smell, or taste these things. So a lot of people drink tap water. They're used to it. They don't taste the chlorine. But there's other contaminants in a lot of tap water. There could be lead in there. There could be glyphosate. There could be somebody's old pharmaceuticals that they flush through the toilet. And then it'll get filtered out in the water processing facility. So all these different things that you get exposed to through the air, through water, um, electromagnetic fields, blue light. So all the, where I live, I'm pointing out, pointing out the window, you can't see out the window, but all the street lights are LED street lights. So when, when that light hits my skin at night, or if I'm not wearing my blue blocking glasses, when that light hits my eyes, that creates inflammation which has an impact on my body's energy production. So all these different things, all these sources of inflammation, especially when it's chronic, when it's ongoing, are behind cancer, neurodegeneration, arthritis, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, which has really exploded, lung diseases. All these different things are driven by inflammation. Now, there are also internal sources of inflammation uh, such as when you have uh, an unhealthy gut, when you ha don't have the right balance in your microbiome, that can create something called LPS, lipo lipopolysaccharides. And when those get in your bloodstream, that creates a lot of inflammation. Or when you have a poor um, microbial um, diversity, that can also create more inflammatory immune cells. And we don't have a good balance of healthy immune cells that can also create a lot of internal inflammation. So you can be eating a very healthy diet, but if you have unchecked stress, if you have some kind of um, an environmental stressor, then that's gonna create inflammation, that's gonna cause symptoms, and eventually that's gonna, you're gonna end up with some kind of chronic disease. So I mentioned apoptosis before. So apoptosis, that is programmed cell death. So when the cell when it's not making enough energy to maintain health or homeostasis, then the cell chooses to die, and then you can make new cells, hopefully which are healthy. Healthy. Now, ideally, what you want your, your cells to be doing is autophagy. So autophagy is the recycling of cells' components. 
and there's different kinds of autophagy. So autophagy is at the cellular level. Mitophagy is more at the mitochondrial level. So you want all these things working well. So when you have damaged mitochondria, they repair themselves so they can continue, get back to making energy. And it's kind of like the difference between apoptosis and autophagy is in your car, if you get a little fender bender, let's say you're going 10 miles per hour and you're texting and driving, you bump into the car in front of you, you can go to the shop and get that repaired. And your car is as good as new as long as you go to a good shop that does, that does good work. That's autophagy. Now, if you're going 70 miles per hour and you go off the road and you hit a tree, your car is totaled. Hopefully you're not dead. But that is apoptosis. You just have to get a whole new car. So these are really key if you want to maintain a long, healthy life. If you want to have good, healthy energy production, you need both of these to be working. And the key to both those working is melatonin. So most, most people know melatonin because it's associated with your circadian rhythm. It helps you get into a deep sleep. But melatonin does a whole lot more than that. Melatonin is actually it's anti-cancer. It's anti-tumor. So people that work shift work, for example, when you're exposed to blue light, your body turns off production of melatonin. So people working shift, they have lower levels of melatonin. They have higher rates of cancer, especially breast cancer and prostate cancer, which are some of the leading cancers for women and men, respectively. Um, melatonin also plays a role in the proper function of your immune system. So you need healthy melatonin levels made internally, endogenously, versus taking a supplement. Because melatonin is a hormone. You don't want to be supplementing hormones because that impacts all your other hormones. You want your body to be making these things themselves if you want optimal health. So melatonin plays a key role in your, uh, your immune system. It inhibits the proliferation of a wide range of different cancer cells. And it also interferes with the blood supply to tumors. So when you have healthy levels of melatonin, it doesn't allow blood to get to the tumor so it can keep on growing. It's also a very potent free radical scavenger in your brain. So you need healthy melatonin levels to maintain brain health. Melatonin also plays a role in, um, in photoreceptors in your eye and the rods and cones. Um, and apropos to this talk, it plays a very key role in energy production. So melatonin, that controls your mitochondrial DNA, which means the making of these proteins are your cytochromes, so you can keep on making energy production. It also plays a role in autophagy and apoptosis. So melatonin regenerates, it protects the mitochondrial respiratory proteins, and lower melatonin levels are associated with higher heteroplasmy levels. So as your heteroplasmy increases, that means you get closer and closer to disease. So melatonin, it's the hormone of darkness. The reason it's called that is because your body releases melatonin in the absence of light. So melatonin is most actively most active in the range of 446 nanometers to 477 nanometers. And the peak right here is 455 nanometers. And guess what the peak frequency is from your cell phone? Or the, the, the highest intensity frequency from your cell phone? It's 455 nanometers. TVs are in a similar range. Computer screens are in a similar range. LED light bulbs, which backlight computer screens and TVs, are in a similar range, and so are fluorescent light bulbs. So all of the our majority of the light we're exposed today indoors, also car, car headlamps, lamp, newer flashlights. All these new lights we're exposed to today happen to turn off our body's melatonin production. Is that a good thing? Now, here's the other thing. This, is, this uh, pie chart here represents the sun. On average, throughout the day, just 2% of the, the light we get from the sun is blue light. So getting blue light from the sun is very different than getting blue light from a screen or an energy efficient light bulb because all these this yellow here represents all the different colors of the rainbow plus uv light plus infrared light 42 percent of the sun throughout the day is infrared light that you can't even see 
but you can feel it in the form of heat, not, not year round. Sometimes in the winter, it's, it's, it's just too cold to feel it, but it's still, it has a biological effect on you year round, regardless of you feeling it or not. So the, the point is, is if you want to maintain the health of your mitochondria, you need to get more sunlight and less indoor light. It's a, uh, it's a big detriment to your health and it's one of the, the main drivers of disease today. It is backed up by a lot of research. Unfortunately, a lot of doctors aren't either A, they're not aware of it, B, if they are aware of it, they're not sharing it with their patients. So you can't wait to get the memo from your doctor. You need to wake up to this now. So let's talk about, let me move my video here. Let's talk about optimal mitochondria. So how do we go from this guy, mitochondria not making energy, to who's sick, to a happy, healthy mitochondria that's cranking out energy so you can get more stuff done, so you can feel better. So sleep. There's no compromising on quality sleep. A lot of people, they, at least when I was in the corporate world, they kind of wore it as like a badge of honor, their ability to get by on as little sleep as possible. That's BS. You don't want to be doing that because at some point you're going to get sick and you're going to be able to do less and less. And you might hit a point of no return, especially if you get neurodegeneration where you lose the ability to have your full brain function and be in control of your faculties. Once you lose that, you're at the mercy of somebody else's care. Maybe that's good care. Maybe it's not good care. But you have a very low likelihood of being able to turn things around at that point. This is I'm dead serious when I say this. I've had a lot of family members that have suffered Alzheimer's disease and in the beginning they're forgetful but then they hit a point where they don't even know who you are and it's showing up in people younger and younger today. We're seeing rates of uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease uh, start to happen in people in their 30s and that has that has grown by over 330 percent over the last five or, or maybe 10 years. A very disturbing trend. So when you sleep, that's when your body does repair and regeneration. That's when your brain does repair and regeneration. So as you get these environmental exposures, as you have these different sources of inflammation, they do damage in your body. That damage needs to be repaired. It needs repaired. It needs to be regenerated. So when you don't regenerate, you degenerate and you age faster, your body falls apart faster, you have more pain, you have less energy, you have more brain fog, you get these different symptoms, you get diseases, and you get a major loss of your health span. You can't enjoy life because you, you suffer from all these different symptoms. You have to spend more time at the doctors getting your pills, doing who knows what when, when you go to the doctor. So sleep is very critical for brain maintenance. So if you value your brain, if you va value your ability to think really well, to be focused, to be able to concentrate well, to be creative about different things, to be engaging when you're hanging out, hanging out with your friends, you got to maintain your brain. Sleep is also key for immunity and detoxification. So your body cleans out the trash at night. When you don't sleep well, you have a decline in immune function. When you have a decline in immune function, you're much more prone to infection. Things like COVID. If you're not sleeping well, you increase your risk for COVID. E even though it has a very low death rate, um, it's still a pain if you get it because you might have to quarantine yourself for, for a long period of time and be away from your family. So ideally, you want to, want to avoid getting um, these diseases go full-blown. So exposure is okay. You want you want exposure to different things, and then your immune system to kick in, take care of it, create antibodies, so it doesn't doesn't affect you in the future. But you don't want to get full blown sick because unfortunately a lot of people never recover from that. Sleep is also critical for memory and concentration. So you consolidate uh, your longer term memories when you sleep. If you're not sleeping well, you're going to be very forget forgetful. You're not going to consolidate the longer term memories. So I do have quite a few videos on sleep and uh, I'll probably do 
At some point, I'll do a deep dive video on some different sleep hacks you can do to really optimize your sleep. Indoor lighting. So the lighting that we have today absolutely sucks. Energy efficient lighting, that is. So if you have LED light bulbs, if you have fluorescent light bulbs, get rid of them. It's not worth the energy savings because not only are you getting blue light, which causes inflammation, which is um, plummeting your melatonin levels, messing up your sleep. They also put off much larger um, electric fields and magnetic fields or higher levels of electromagnetic radiation than good old fashioned energy inefficient incandescent bulbs. So you want to be going back to incandescent bulbs. The reason they got phased out is because they're energy inefficient. A lot of the energy gets converted to heat. And guess what that heat is that it gets converted to? Infrared light. Infrared light, I didn't get into it in, in this talk, but infrared light plays a role. It has a very um, positive biological effect. Your body can use that infrared light to make energy. It's also anti-inflammatory. So by swapping out light bulbs, you're swapping out inflammation for anti-inflammation. You're going to have to spend a little more on your electric bill. The bulbs don't last as long. I get it. But they're much, much healthier for you. If you can't get incandescent, then halogen is your next best bet. Near-infrared bulbs. They sell these big um, red heat lamps. I think I have one. So you've probably seen them in, in hotel room bathrooms. But it's a, um, it's a big red light bulb like this. Puts off heat. But you're getting 850 nanometer light, which your body responds to, has a positive biological response to. But you're also getting higher frequencies of infrared light, which are um, which create heat. And in the wintertime, it feels really good. There are different red light panels. So I will put a link below in the description if you're interested in the red light panel that I recommend. I am an affiliate, full disclosure. Um, also put a link to this bulb, which I'm not an affiliate for, but this is um, this bulb is only 10 bucks, but it's low EMF. So some of the, the near infrared bulbs out there are higher EMF. But um, this is, if you don't want to spend a lot of money, this is a great starting point. If you have it in your budget, a red light panel, especially in the winter time when you're not getting outside, that's a very good option too. But that does not replace the sun. You do want to be getting out and, and be getting healthy sun exposure. But... Um, where I live, I live in upstate New York. It's very overcast in the winter. Having the ability, excuse me, having the ability to supplement uh, more red light during the winter is a great benefit to uh, help you maintain your health during those colder uh, winter months. You also want to limit your screen time at night. If you haven't swapped out your light bulbs yet, you want to limit your exposure to those light bulbs at night. When I read at night, I have an infrared light bulb I got from a pet store. They sell it for reptiles to keep them warm. But it doesn't turn off your body's production of melatonin. And it provides enough light for me to read to at night. And plus I'm getting a little extra infrared light to uh, reduce any inflammation I, I may have uh, gotten from exposure during the day. So EMF mitigation, just a couple of more high level things. Turn off your, your Wi-Fi at night. For me, I'm hardwired. So I have my, my router and I have um, uh, insulated, I think they're CAT 7 or 8 cables, going from my router to my computers so I have internet connection. Also, if I want to use like Amazon Prime or I canceled my Netflix, but... Um, if I want to watch my TV through something online, I just run a cable from my router to my um, to my TV to to be able to connect to those other sources of video. So I'm not exposed to that extra source of of wireless radiation. You don't want any electronics in your bedroom. So if you have a TV in there, that's bad news. Get it out. Modern TVs today, they're smart TVs, meaning that. Even when the TV's turned off, it's still emitting wireless radiation because there's essentially there's a Wi-Fi in your TV, so you can watch shows without being without a cable. That's not a good thing. So you want to get that out of your bedroom, and at the very least, you want to be turning off the power supply to it. 
It's got to be unplugged or it's going to be emitting wireless radiation. Turn off your cell phone at night or just have it far away from your bedroom. Uh, get rid of wireless home phones and wireless home appliances. So wireless home phones, they actually emit more wireless radiation than your cell phone does. Um, and again, remember this radiation causes inflammation. It causes um, an increase in these respiratory proteins in your mitochondria. So you make less ATP, you have less energy. When you have less energy, you, you feel tired. You don't think well. You struggle with brain fog. Those things aren't good. You don't want those things. I've had them all. Not good. Um, today, a lot of there's a big push from the tech sector, people like uh, B. Gates, who I'm not a fan of, but for these smart homes where you have all these appliances that talk to the IoT, the Internet of Things, get rid of that crap. You don't need it. Everything you have, all these smart appliances you have, add an extra layer of electro pollution, creating more inflammation, which in the beginning, most people can't feel. A lot of people, it's below their level of perception. It does have a biological effect. It's backed up by not just hundreds, thousands of different research studies. We know that it causes inflammation. It causes, um, it opens voltage-gated calcium channels, which allow more calcium into the cell, causing inflammation. So it does a whole bunch of bad things. But you want to um, really do kind of an audit in your home and get rid of as many of these things as you can. And when you are buying new appliances, opt out of getting a smart appliance. Get something that's maybe a little bit of an older model. Not only will you save some money, but it's made, a lot of these older models are made better. They last longer. A lot of these new appliances are total crap. They last for a couple years. And instead of repairing them, the company will just replace it with another one and put it in a landfill. So it's not really energy efficient if it lasts just a couple years and you just throw it in a landfill. That's, that's a waste. So I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, which I'm known to do, but uh, hey. Next slide, nutrition. So the only thing I'm going to talk about as far as nutrition is DHA. DHA, you want to get that from seafood because remember, you want your DHA to be in the SN2 position. When you get your DHA from algae, that's SN1 or SN3. It's not paramagnetic. It doesn't get into the cell as well. Your body has to convert it, and it converts that at a very low efficiency. So DHA plays a very important role in maintaining a healthy nervous system and important for your eyes, your brain, your cell membranes, so many things. It's also important for you to increase your body's energy production. Cold exposure. One of my favorite hacks is exposing myself to cold. So doing full body submersion in cold water. So for years and years and years, I hated the cold. When I got sick with Lyme disease and I was trying to turn it around, I heard about this. And as much as I hated the cold, I hated Lyme disease and being sick even more. So I learned to embrace cold and it was a huge tool. It was a huge biohack in me reversing all the symptoms I had from chronic Lyme disease. And the reason is, is it improves mitochondrial function. It makes your mitochondria perform more efficiently, make, meaning they make more energy. With more energy, you have an increased ability for your body to repair. It releases leptin from fat. It makes you more leptin sensitive. So at some point, I'll do another video on the role of leptin. It's one of the most important hormones in the body because it controls other hormones. So leptin resistance, just like insulin resistance is behind diabetes and obesity, Leptin resistance tends to show up five to seven years before insulin resistance. And leptin resistance can drive a, a whole spectrum of different symptoms and disease, but one of the big ones is obesity. So if you have a problem with weight, most likely you are leptin resistant. Cold will help you reverse that. There are other things you can do too. Cold also decreases inflammation if you're dealing with a lot of pain. When I had Lyme disease, I had was very sensitive to aches and pains. One of the things Lyme disease does is you have very low levels of alpha MSH. When you have low alpha MSH, you're much more sensitive to pain. Lyme creates a lot of inflammation. So I had very intense pain in here, in my neck, and cold exposure 
it shuts that down. It, it played a huge role in decreasing my pain and cold exposure. It increases longevity. It, re, it releases a hormone in your fat called adiponectin, and that helps you to live longer. Cold also increases AMPK, which has lots of anti-aging benefits. AMPK, that activates other genes. This goes back to the, the beginning of having a, a healthy gut, um, gut genome because through doing that, you can increase AMPK, which increases longevity, decreases inflammation, it increases the health of your cells, um, increases fat burning, and so much more. So intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is great to improve autophagy, which is keeping your cells clean, keeping them young, uh, repairing damage, getting rid of the trash. It decreases inflammation. It increases immunity. I mentioned healthy cells, cellular cleansing. It's also It also increases fat burning. So anytime you go without food for more than 12 hours, your body can only store 12 hours of glycogen, which is stored glucose. Once it burns through all the glycogen, it turns to burning fat. So intermittent fasting, great way to burn fat, but it's also a very important key to maintain the health of your mitochondria. So I'm going to share, I promise I would share one of my favorite hacks to really uh, increase anti-aging, and that is combining fasting with cold with, I didn't mention exercise, but exercise also increases autophagy, it increases mitochondrial biogenesis, and the most efficient form of exercise is high intensity. So one of my hacks that I use I'm, as, as of this recording, I'm 49 years old, one of the hacks I use to, to stay young, and at 49, I'm physically stronger than I was at 21. I was, I was lifting weights for, for longer hours at 21. In all honesty, I haven't been lifting weights lately because my gym has been closed. But before I got my gym closed down and I wasn't lifting weights, I was physically stronger at, at 48 <coughs> than I was at 21. Lifting for 20 minutes two days a week versus three hours three days a week when I was 21. So you're in your physiological prime in your late teens, early 20s, and at more than twice that age, I'm doing better then. I feel more mentally sharp. My memory is better. My sleep is better. Everything is better at 49 than in my 20s, and it's all due to these doing, due to these different things. And one of my key hacks that I do two days a week, I'll do intermittent fasting. I will do uh, sprints. I'll do sets of sprints and um, now where I live, it's, it's getting cold sometimes in the, a couple times in the mornings, it's been in the thirties. So I'm combining fasting, cold and high intensity exercise. It's a great hack to ramp up AMPK, which increases longevity and increases fat burning, decreases inflammation, increases cellular cleansing. So when you combine these, these things, they have an amplified effect. So that's it for today, guys. And, uh, hey, I hope you got a lot of value out of it. So thanks for checking it out. I really appreciate your time. Today was a long one, about an, about an hour or so. If you have questions or comments, please comment below. And if you have questions, you can email me. Also, there's a link below to my biohacking guide. Those are, there's more biohacks in there that are going to help you improve the health of your mitochondria, live a longer life, have more energy so you can get more done. Have better focus, concentration, so you do better at work. You can, you can leave your competition behind. By making these, these different hacks, by making these different uh, habits a part of your life or different actions, your, your new habits, so they're a part of your life. Also, please give this a thumbs up. My videos are getting much fewer views today than they used to. On some level, level I believe I, I am being censored because... I'm getting more subscribers, but my views are going down. So please, if you like this, give it a thumbs up, share it, and uh, I'll see you again real soon.